Dobar večer. Hvala, ker ste prišli prvič, drugič, tretič ali koliko že. Veseli me, da ste si tudi ogledali razstavo o Petrici Pičinini. Welcome, Patricia, again here. And just like also welcome to everybody. And I think that it are, are this artist talk would be the, the best to make uh, with the presentation of your work. So please. Well, welcome everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be in such an intimate group of art aficionados. It is quite amazing that you're here with me instead of out there with the Lent crowd. So thank you for coming. I'll try and make the, this as entertaining as possible, but, um, uh, and I'll try not to talk too long. But um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to just read um, a short, very short and straightforward text that I've written about my work, which outlines the most important um, facts that I think are um, crucial to understanding my work. And then I'll just show you images of my studio. And then I'll show you images of other works. Because we are such a, a small group, um, I'm really happy for you to just ask questions as we go along. And in fact, I always like to ask people, is there anything that you'd like me to address in my talk as I as I speak? Anything that you particularly want to know about? No? Well, if something does come up, let me know. Okay. Um, so, my practice is focused on bodies and relationships. The relationships between people and other creatures. So this is a work called Unfur Unfurled. It's very new and it's uh, uncompromising in its um, complete uh, kind of um, un unacknowledgement that this relationship between humans and other creatures is idealized. So what does that mean? It means that it's, it's not afraid to present this relationship. This is the kind of relationship we want with nature. And it knows it's, it, it's very self-conscious and it knows that it's doing it. So between people and bodies, this is a work called Atlas, and it's about this high. It's also made out of silicon. And it's a, it's a work um, that is kind of amorphous as well. It's a work that doesn't have a head. It's very hard to empathize with a work like this. But what I'm trying to do here is um, ask questions about what animates this body. If, if it doesn't have a head, what, what gives it um, impetus? And that's a very interesting question today because we now know that many of the things we're doing do not come from rational thought. They come from other places, places like even your gut. That's a very popular idea. Places like the chemicals that flow around in your body. Between creatures and the environment. Now this is a huge diorama. This diorama is as big as this space and you can walk into it. And again, it depicts a kind of relationship between humans and nature. Interestingly, this relationship is uh, fleshed out in an artificial space. Fleshed out is I constructed it in an artificial space of a museum. So we go to a museum to work out our relationship to nature. So we're going to an artificial space to understand nature. Between the artificial and the natural. 
This is a really new work. I really love this work. It's called um, Teenage Metamorphosis, and it's a creature that I, that's um, kind of pig-like, um, human-like, uh, and it's also got the soul of a shoe, like the soul, not not the spiritual soul, but the soul on the back of its ba on its back. So it's talking about the idea that. Um, it, like boot flower, that it, it's possible for us to understand the body that is not just blended with the body of another species, but actually it can be blended with an inanimate object. I love this work because it's quite humorous. He's reading um, Kafka's Metamorphosis, and he's kind of like got this sort of, sort of almost surly look on his face as teenagers have, like. Are you looking at me? It's a very new work. Um, so what defines a relationship is where one party ends and the other starts. But what happens when that boundary starts to, to disappear or was never that well defined in the first place. So boundaries are very important to me. That's what my work is all about. The boundary between what we define as artificial and what we define as natural. And this is a work called The Bond, and it's obviously a relationship between this transgenic creature and a human. So these kinds of relationships are very interesting for me to depict because I'm interested in our relationship to the stuff that we create. And I try and bring these propositions forward to the public, and then I'm interested in what the public thinks in response, feels in response. What happens to us when we recognize that we are just one animal among many? So the, the bond, the other work, was a human with a transgenic creature. And this one, holding a, a child, this one is a transgenic uh, creature holding a human baby. Um, this is quite an old work, actually. It's about 10 years old. And at that point, I was really interested in, um, well, I just had a child. And um, I'll just tell you the story. I just had a child. And um, I couldn't, I, I didn't, I couldn't breastfeed my child. Um, didn't know how to do it. And so my sister said to me, "Oh, you should breastfeed my son, who's my nephew." I said, "No, no, I, I'm not going to do that." But I did breastfeed my nephew, and he actually taught me how to breastfeed because it's not intuitive. And I just thought, wow, this boundary between me and my nephew has just collapsed. Uh, and that's why this transgenic creature is breastfeeding a human baby, because I experienced that collapse. And then the other thing that happened was, um, I'm from Africa, I was born in Africa, and um, if you come from Africa, you have many, many stories about what happens there. And um, one of the, one of my, um, husband's friends told me his story, and his story was that uh, his baby sister was taken away um, by baboons, a baboon mother who had lost her child. So this baboon mother came into his house, took his sister out of her cot, and took her away. And I thought, wow, I could really understand how if you lost your baby, you would do anything to get back that precious relationship. You would even adopt an ugly human baby. You would do that. And that's what this baboon mother did. And that's why this baboon mother is holding a human baby. Um, and and that's, that's the two influences on this work. That's how I came to this, this um, the concept of this piece. But really, it's about nurturing and the idea that if we create new life, what is our relationship to it? And obviously, this mother has got an, a physical relationship because she's breastfeeding this child and also an emotional relationship because you can see it in her eyes. 
So um, perhaps because I'm drawn to advances in genetics and the, and the natural world, many people have looked at my practice in terms of science and technology. However, for me, it is just as informed by surrealism and mythology. What interests me is the stories that we tell to explain the world, and especially the complexity that arises when the rational, the emotional, and the ethical collide. So a lot of my work is not about what the right answer is. It doesn't give you the solution to anything. It just presents all the problems. And in fact, it's a reflection of how confounding it is to live a, a life today. And this work is about how technology is becoming increasingly naturalized, which means that it's possible for us to see machines and technology as our nature. Like I can look at a, a computer and talk to it and think that it has a personality. Like my car is an extension of my body. Like it has a personality as well. It sometimes disappoints me and it does it on purpose. That sort of stuff. Oh, did I skip it? Did I skip a work? Did I? Oh, okay, maybe. Oh, yeah. No, no, it's okay. So, I hope my work leads people to leads people to wonder at and wonder about the world around them and question their assumptions about the relationships they have with the world. I'm happy to tell people what I think, but I don't claim to have the answers. I want to be involved in the conversation. So this work is a, wor a work called The Osculating Curve, and you can see, actually, it's quite surreal. It's a, it's a, it's a pregnant form. The, the whole work is about fecundity. It's like the potential for production. Um, like it's got, a, it's got a lot in it. It's about, it's, it's about the future of birth. It's actually not even about the future of birth. It's about how we understand birth and how that's changing. And like, um, it, uh, interestingly, in the last few years, there's this new technology called CRISPR, and it will be an integral part of, of how we understand and and. I'm going to say action uh, births, <laughs> it's such a technical term, but, but engage with births. So I'm interested in how that changes uh, the way we see reproduction. So my work begins with wondering about where we draw the line between ourselves and the world. Is there really a distinction between what we call nature and what we call culture? Are people really different from animals? Are dogs natural or artificial? And this is the boot flower, which is in this show. This is undivided. I've made a lot of works about intimacy and about our relationships to the, change, change, the changing nature around us. I'm especially interested in things that fall outside of our traditional ideas of normal or beautiful, or that disregard the boundaries that we erect between things. These creatures are all beautiful to me, but some do find them disturbing. And I ask, do monsters have to be scary? Could this be a metaphor for how we tend to relate to other kinds of difference? And that's one of the things about living in a contemporary society where um, there, is, there are so many innovations that tend to make things, 
that tend to that tend to diminish the space for difference. Like as soon as you find a way of changing the body, then you almost have to do it. Like, for example, everybody has to have straight teeth because we have the technology. Like if you don't give your children braces, you're not being a good parent. But there's no, there's, you know, crooked teeth, they can be sexy. You know, it, it, there's no imperative to have straight teeth. And let, if your bite is okay, you don't have to have straight teeth. But because we have the technology, we feel we have to have it. We have to have straight, everyone must have perfect white teeth. Which brings me to care. The work that I make is warm which is probably not cool, but something that I don't shy away from. The ethics of care and responsibility are at the core of my practice. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a key text for me, but I see it from the monster's perspective. What is our relationship with and responsibility towards that which we create? Could we love our mistakes as much as our successes? So, I mean, obviously, Frankenstein is a very influential text for me. It's a book about bad parenting. Like that, that's what it's about. And I feel that um, we're at a point in history where um, that's quite similar to Mary Shelley's time when she wrote her amazing book like she was at the birth of the just before the industrial revolution and also the year that she wrote that book there was a very big natural um, uh, disaster uh, on the other side of the world a volcano erupted and it spewed ash into the sky and the, the, the skies were dark all over Europe for two years and the crops failed so the villages in, in France where she wrote this book, she went to France with Shelley and Byron and a group of you know, um, English aristocrats. Um, they saw these um, farmers leave the farms uh, because there was no food. And they were turned away at the cities because they were thought to be bringing disease and, and they were too needy. So they were treated very badly. And that's how the monster is treated in her book. That was a big inspiration for her. And I think in a way we're at a similar time. Like there's this whole new explosion of technology and also we have this sort of imminent environmental um, sort of, uh, I, hate, I hate the word uh, catastrophe, but I mean, there could be catastrophic results from things like global, global warming. So it's, it's almost like it's a similar time. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll talk further about this work later. So ideas rather than methods are central to the way I work. Although drawing plays an essential generative role in everything I do, I work with whatever media seems best suited to evoking the sorts of thoughts and emotions I'm interested in working with. So, yeah, I'm going to show you my studio, but basically all my work comes from drawings. It comes from thinking. I, I consider myself qu quite a conceptual artist, that every single work has a strong narrative and idea behind it. And I, and I, could, I could spend an hour talking about each work. Um, so these are the kinds of drawings I did at, um, when I was at art school. I spent a lot of time in anatomy museums. So I still do quite a lot of drawings. So this is a drawing I did last year. And you can see how these drawings translate very easily into the kind of sculptures that I make. They're very realistic. I make um, really big sculptures. This is a, a really big work. It's six foot. It's a kind of, you know, it's something that would be hard to put in someone's lounge room. 
Um, I make small sculptures. This is something that sits in your hand. It's made out of bronze and painted with um, automotive paint. This is called infestation. I make paintings. Um, this is the same silicon that all the sculptures are made from, and that's what I love about it, that, that silicon, you can change, you can make this stuff into, into the skin that you see over there. Um, but I love this sort of organic quality it has by itself, even though it's, in, it's totally artificial. I make uh, installations like boot flower. I make uh, videos like the breathing room. I make um, hairy things. This is a hairy, hairy work. I make shiny things. I make hot air balloons. I make photographs. Whatever I think tells the story that I'm interested in telling, which is the story of what it's like to live a life today. But before I get into some of my stories, I wanted to take you behind the scenes and show you a bit about my studio. So this is my room. So I, my studio is a bit like this this, um, this space. It used to be a factory that um, made garments. And I built inside, just like here, I built a little room inside the space for myself. And this is where I sit and read and, and think and draw and have all my, you know, my bits and pieces. And I put carpet down um, because I had children. So when they were children, I could just let the children wander around anywhere and they, it would be OK. Uh, this is um, looking down on it, so th that's all the crates of all the work I have. <laughs> I have a lot of work. Uh, this is the fume room. One of the, the fantastic thing about having um, you know, a studio is that you can um, make it safe. So m the materials I work with aren't really toxic, but I'm very, very aware of um, uh, yeah, having a safe environment for everybody to work in. So that, is a, that whole room is a fume room. And, and when you close the door and you put the extraction fan on and the, and the air gets sucked out, you can't open the door. It's just so strong. Um, these are, this is the mold making room. Uh, do a lot of testing. About 30% of everything that happens in the studio is testing, I would say, uh, because um, it's a very... Um, the, the uh, material is very finicky. It's got very many um, uh, variables. So you have, we have to test over and over and over and over all the time to, 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 to make it do what we want it to do. So, and, and that's hard when you're an artist because you, know, you don't have the money just to test. Like, really don't. But you still have to do it. This is the painting room. So all of these works are uh, paint. They have a bit of paint on top of the silicon, but a lot of a lot of the colour is intrinsic. So it's laid in the mould. These and these are the moulds. So the moulds themselves. Sometimes I wish I could just exhibit the mould because they are they are just so beautiful. They're almost like works of art. And um, and you know what? I've actually seen artists do that. Like I said, that's a mold. Um, but, but then I sort of, yeah, I get it. It's really beautiful. Yeah. But they, all, they start out first as drawings, and then they get um, digitized, and then they ma they're made into plasticine, and the mold is made from the plasticine. So this is a new work that I'm working on now, and it's going to be in a show next year. And this piece will have... Um, fiberglass pieces as part of it and leather pieces as well. So this silicon piece will be maybe a third of it. This is, um, so hair punching is a very important part of my work. So this is the hair punching room. Um, and we use all kinds of different materials like 
natural hair, um, all kinds of animal furs. And um, yeah, it's a very involved process. And I've really worked very um, in-depthly with it. And that's those works in there that are pictures made out of punched hair are very important to my practice because um, I really love the idea of drawing with hair. Uh, this is the, one of the main working areas downstairs. So this is part of a new sculpture that's for an exhibition in March next year. Um, but you can see, you know, it's very, very used, this space. This is a detail of that new piece. Well, again, it's about pregnancy and fecundity, which is the potential for production. Oh, these are some of the people that I work very closely with in my studio. So this this guy in the blue, he's Dennis Daniel. I've, he does all the digital work in my studio. I've worked with him for about 15 years. Uh, next to him is uh, Liz Rule, and she does all the hair punching. And the lady here, this is Mutsumi, she does all the seams. Like where, when you make a mold, um, there's a lot of seaming involved, and it's, and it's, it's really tough to, um, uh, to get to, you have to cut it out and then fill it up with more silicon and then kind of sculpt it on top so that the, the, so that the seam disappears. Because if you have a seam, you won't, it, all of these works have seams, a lot of seams. And if you see the seam, you won't, you won't believe it. So we have to get rid of it and it's a really important and difficult process. That's Mutsumi there, she's brilliant. But they all are, they're all brilliant. And these are more tests. This is Isabel. She, um, she, does, all the pe uh, she does all the painting. Um, so um, all the color in the, in the work is actually painted inside the mold. These are the molds. So we paint the color inside and then we lay it up with the, the um, the more opaque silicon afterwards. So the first color is very translucent, and that's why we get, like skin on the surface is translucent. It, like light travels through skin, and then it bounces up. So it goes through the skin and then bounces back up, and that's what our silicon does as well. We have a little bit of area which is translucent, and then it, the, light, the light bounces up from the opaque silicon underneath. And that's why it looks so realistic. This is Mutsumi dealing with the seams. This is me looking at one of the works. This is Alistair. He's one of the people um, that helps fabricate all the internal structures with Isabel. Um, this was um, this is the this is the uh, fabricating room. This is a work that I made called Graham. It's in pieces. Oh, this is Lee. So Lee's one of the sculptors that I work with. So I give him the, the drawings for him to um, sculpt from. Uh, this is me with one of the works. So we, we often use me because I'm a bit of a, I'm a good resource because I'm always around. So I said, Lee, can you make, can you make the sculpture have my nose? And he said, sure, of course I'm gonna, of course. and so she has my nose. I wanted her to look a bit more normal. And this is another sculptor that I work with. Can't see him. This is Isabel again working. So um, this is Lee and me. This is Isabel. So basically, all these people who work with me, like Isabel is a brilliant documentary maker. So she works for a few days for me, and then she goes off and makes documentaries. So ev everyone that I work with um, has probably their own practice. Um, and then they work for me to get paid. And, and they're treated very, you know, I give them a lot of um, autonomy so, and um, credit. So, um, you know, it's a good working environment. And so, yeah, a lot of skilled people. So it takes a lot of people to make my work. Oh, that's one of the, that's me making one of the works. This is a new piece being painted. See, they're painted with an airbrush. Oh, this is Liz. She's, she's punching in the hair. 
Okay, so so basically, um, I, so I went to art school and I studied um, uh, drawing and painting, and um, and I still obviously I use drawing a lot in my work to communicate to the people that I work with how the work should be, uh, but. It's not really important to me that I, obviously it's not important to me that I make the work. Uh, I'm not interested in the process of it at all. Like, I, it's not important to me that people see my mark. Um, what's important to me is the ideas of the work. That, that is all that I'm interested in and the resulting object. Like, I'm, I am quality control. You know, I'm there all the time, making sure that you know it's you know it's coming out in the way that I you know, I imagine it to be, and people need me to be like that. They really need me to be there to you know to guide them, to tell them how it needs to be, because otherwise we have to redo it, and then that's that's very boring for everyone. So yeah, so I thought I'd just let you in on how how this work is made, and that's why. The, the work is so varied because I work with many different people and I don't want the work to be limited by my um, particular skills and by my body. I, you know, if I want to make um, a hot air balloon, I, I don't want to sew it up. You know, it, take, it takes months to sew up a hot air balloon. Um, I, I, if I want to make a video, I can't do the animation. It takes years to be an animator. Um, I'm, the, I'm the person who uh, creates the world and I work closely with incredibly gifted and talented individuals um, and artists in their own right to, to make this world come to life. And that's why there's so much love in the work and that's why it's so beautifully made because we all really care about it. Um, and interestingly, um, in, the, in the last few years, I've started to collaborate with people as well. And I, one of the people that I collaborate with is my partner, Peter Hennessy. Um, he, he helped everybody here install the work. And uh, we made this exhibition um, last year for the MCA in Sydney, and it's called Alone with the Gods. And... Um, yeah, it was a kind of, had a very strong narrative. Um, and it was about this idea of, um, uh, it was about this idea that this, this sort of charismatic leader had done the most amazing thing and he'd um, been able to make his body give birth. And he gives birth to uh, a girl and this girl has never known a distinction between nature and artifice because she's always been locked away. And she's a beautiful gardener, and so as a gardener, she creates all these amazing life forms. So it had a very strong narrative, and, um, and this is the, the space where all this took place. It was quite nostalgic. It was a real environment that people could go into. Um, it's, it's probably one of the things that I'm most proud of, this installation. So these are, one of, these are some of the life forms that the gardener, the girl, has created. Yeah, I'm really interested in, well, Peter and I are both really interested in sea squirts. So sea squirts are these little uh, marine animals. And but just let me tell you about them. You, you, you'll see them at the beach. Sea squirts are spawned from their parents and they, and they, and they wander through the sea until they find the place where they're going to live for their whole lives, and they attach themselves to that place. It's usually a rock. When they do that, they, 
the first thing they do is they eat their brain and then their spinal cord because they don't need it. They only keep their reproductive organs and their digestive organs. So we're just both really amazed how this, at this evolutionary kind of um, adaptation that if you don't need your brain, just eat it. And, and that's what they do. And so we were really enamored with these guys and they ended up on a lot of these sculptures. And they're quite beautiful too. I think they're very essential. So that sea squirts look a lot like that. You know, when you walk on the beach, you'll see them. They're, they're everywhere in Australia. Yeah. So I made uh, quite a lot of, we made quite a lot of transgenic creatures as well. So she's a dancing shoe. I really like shoes. There's a lot of boots and shoes in my work. And Peter indulges me. And that is the, the torso, the remnant, the relic of the big man who gave birth. It's, it, I, I, it's, yeah, that's, that's his pregnant pouch, pregnancy pouch. No, I mean, look, it's, it's not really incredibly far-fetched. And it's really, a, it's a kind of mythology. It's a mythology to speak about things like that, about the changing nature of birth. And, and, and I don't think the work is saying that this is a bad thing either. Like his body is um, got this amazing eagle that's made out of hair on it. To me, it's like pretty beautiful, pretty desirable, actually. And smacks of um, body ornamentation that we all are very used to, like tattooing. So that's what the installation looked like. So Peter's an architect, so he's got a very kind of strong spatial. Um, understanding of things where I'm more object-based. Uh, we also did this other work in Tasmania as well, in this beautiful industrial space which used to be a, um, a uh, printing, printing uh, of a newspaper press, a printing press. And this is, um, as you came in, you saw this big imposing sculpture. It was like this rubbish monster that, that, that lived in the sea. There it is. It was like this huge thing. It was like this stuff that, um, that just collected itself and it sort of took on this sort of, um, uh, this kind of um, uh, spiritual dimension almost. It became, it became, um, yeah, it became almost alive, I suppose. And um, we had this amazing um, jazz singer um, uh, sing to it, and there was this communication with it. And she was pregnant at the time. It was really quite beautiful, and she sang like a, like a humpback whale. So humpback whale, um, we were very, also very um, intrigued by, and enamored is a better word, we love them. Um, humpback whales come to Australia, and one of the things about them is that they, they sing. What they do is they hang upside down like this and they sing. And these, um, way, these sound waves travel and the songs travel. And, and she, had, she was singing to it in this most incredibly um, beautiful and, and sort of um, unselfconscious way. And it was, the whole show was about connections between natu nature and artifice. I, I made a lot of mushrooms. There's a lot of, there's quite a few. M mushrooms are really interesting for me because they, they, kind of are, they kind of defy categorization. In fact, we know very little about them. So I, I'm very intrigued by them and I make a lot of them. And they're also the sexual organs of this, of the, um, this sort of huge organism that's, that lives in the ground. Um, and so there's lots of mushrooms on there. This is a massive um, 
frieze, the colourful frieze. Um, that's that's the space. It's a, a little bit like this in a way. It's a little bit a little bit rough. And that's Metaflora. That's here. And here is a boy that's connecting with a mushroom woman. Yeah. So it's quite, it's, 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 yeah, it's quite, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, there's an element of wonder in it. But the thing about all this work is it's all completely sincere. Like there's no irony in it at all. Like I made this mushroom woman and this mushroom woman has a lot of integrity. Like I would like to meet that mushroom woman. I would love to meet her. I would love to connect with her. And so I made her. And this boy is connecting with her. And she kind of embodies the kind of um, the kind of wonder that nature represents and that I would like to be connected to, but find it very hard to do in this sort of uh, contemporary world. And so she's kind of a, I don't know, some kind of embodiment of that. And that's what I do as an artist. That's what I do. I make a kind of very, uh, um, uh, uh, I want to say spectacle, but it's not quite spectacle. I make a kind of uh, visualization of that. Yes, I'm really interested in birth. So there's lots of births in my work. Like the, the boot flower is a birth. Uh, and this is a birth too. And the reason why I made this work is because, um, you know, if you're not... If you're not bored from a cesarean section, you've traveled down a vagina, like we all have. Like we, and, it's a, and it's an amazing thing. And, I, and I've had two children, and the way that my body transformed to let these two children out was pretty intense. Like it really was. It was kind of grotesque. But at the same time, kind of beautiful. And, you know, I just wanted to celebrate that. And I just feel that we should see this everywhere. And it should be something that we could really rejoice and love and be just ubiquitous, which means, like, you see it everywhere, but it's just so hidden. And so I just made a work about it. I just love it. And interestingly, I had some midwives come through, and they said, that's exactly what it looks like. And I was thrilled to hear, see that. Um, you know, I, I don't think you need to be a feminist to like this. I don't even think you need to be a mother. I just think you need to be a human. Uh, but some people don't like it. And I really don't know why. So there's my dancing boot with the Johnny Cash hairdo. It's another mushroom. So there's a, you know, there's a real element of the uncanny about this work. Yeah, it's a favorite work of mine. Um, more mushrooms, more mushrooms, more mushrooms, more mushrooms. This is meadow, like we have here. And I really love flowers because they are the sexual organs of plants. But the thing about these flowers here is that they're also chimeras. Did you notice that they have a beak of a bird in them? They're so, and they're kind of, they're a little bit like ovaries. And I just, I just love the sensuality of them, I suppose. And also it's, I mean, plants are, in, are an area where we have really, uh, as, as a species, we've really cultivated different plants t for ourselves and now we're doing it at a very fundamental level. 
Um, and I'm pretty interested in that. I'm interested in how we do that and, and what that means to us um, and our bodies. So when we, um, when we use uh, gene editing technology to make plants that are resistant to um, certain pests, inherently resistant to that, what does that mean? And, and I'm interested in asking um, the people around me what they think about it, and that's why I make this work. And also that's why this work uh, doesn't say that this is good or bad, but it kind of gives a kind of reflection, a kind of very intense reflection, very poetic and lyrical reflection of what's, what we're doing to, to the nature around us. As well as being, you know, you know very kind of wondrous, and to me, this is a, you know, when we, go to, when we see this piece, we think, wow, we're witnessing a birth. So um, any kind of birth is good for me in my book. Any kind of life is good, if it's artificial or not. I just think it's pretty great. Um, and and she, this is an auspicious moment. And she's picked an auspicious, uh, an important, a beautiful place to give birth in this meadow. And here she is, part human, part plant, part boot. And, and that's the thing about this work, is that uh, it's possible for us to imagine the body to be blended, to be so flexible as to be blended, not just with other species, but with objects. And, and that's not my idea. That's, I didn't make that up. That's it's sort of floating in the world. And I'm just making this kind of reflection of it in this kind of, uh, I guess, um, uh, poetic way. I, I, I guess it's kind of lyrical, I suppose. It's kind of wondrous. Uh, I'm, I'm making a reflection of it. And so if, if in the future people um, see this work, they will say about the, this community who produced this work, who were able to have the imagination to produce this work, um, that this imagination was enabled by the idea that the body is so protean, so changeable, that it could be blended in this way. Can you see the heel in the in the sole? Yeah, she's very sensual to me. Uh, the whole the whole work was about fertility. It was all about the potential for production, uh, which is you know which is in interesting ethical idea as well. Like. How productive do we need to be? You know, how, how, how much growth does our economy need? How, how much do we need to make? Um, so is this a good or a bad thing? How, how much change? What, what should we do with the nature around us? And how much, what, what is a good enough reason to change nature? And can we do it just for beauty's sake, for art's sake? And so these are the vanitases, these are the kind of the, the life cycles of these, of these creatures. Oh yeah, and this was the, the environments that they're all in the space. More mushrooms. I mean, I joke about mushrooms, but, I'm, but, but there's a lot about them that's very interesting to me because they kind of defy categorization. Like they're, they're, and they're sort of a beautiful entity that has these symbiotic relationships with other, um, with other species. So, things, um, so 
what I'm really interested in with mushrooms is that you know they we need them for we need them for, in nature Na nature needs them and we so know so little about them and that's why I feature so much they feature so much in my work and these are sort of small chimeras as well now look do you think that I've sort of spoken enough guys have you should should we should I should I open it up to you if you have any questions We can, if you wish. Do you, ha do you have any questions at all? Kakšno vprašanje? Questions? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah. Uh, I'm very interested. What's your relations to uh, the aesthetics of your work? Do you have your own uh, perception of what is aesthetical? Are you trying to make your own aesthetics? And if is it important to you? And the second question is uh, about the nature of your creations, yeah. because for me they they are kind of alive. And do you imagine the stories after you create them, yeah. uh, like a life for them? Do you imagine this this as well? Okay. So do do I think I th I think I do have a an aesthetic uh, sensibility. Um, I, I, I think I'd have to as an artist. Like, and I think it's, and I, I, I think you could recognize m my work. Um, like, it, yeah, it has, you know, ha it has, uh, it has some recurring themes uh, and, and the way it looks as well. I think one of the, one of the, one of it is, one, a part of that is, um, uh, the way it's made, like it's very carefully made. Um, it's often there's a, an element of say nurture involved. A, lo a lot of it has to do with nurture, and I think that's quite n recognizable. Uh, I think the main thing is it, it 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 does have an element of grotesqueness about it, but it doesn't it it doesn't try and shock people that's just it comes about because you know we are inherently um, inherently hardwired to be um, suspicious of difference so that's when people might think that it's not aesthetic it's not beautiful but I, I think it is beautiful and I try and make it as beautiful as I can um, yeah uh um, maybe the question wasn't understandable because it, for me they are very beautiful, very beautiful forms. Uh, but uh, what was my question uh, concerning is, uh, is the design that you make for these creatures as important as for the content, so uh, as uh, for their lives oh. afterwards oh. when you create them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they, yes. And in fact, it's a very hard part of the process. And it is almost like sitting down and playing God. Like you sit down and think, oh, okay, I'm gonna make a work that discusses um, uh, the way that uh, we understand the body to be not uh, motivated by rational thought. And so, you, and so you, you, that's the idea. And when one sits down to do that, it's almost like playing God. It's almost like how would how would you, how do you express this? How, how, that's what Atlas is about. The second slide, or even Ghost, or you know, the, the, um, and and yeah, I think it is. I do have a, a aesthetic sensibility, and um, and part of it is is, is that I don't try and just represent reality. Um, that that's that's not my goal. In fact, I use realistic sculpture to then undercut reality to present something which is not real. So that's part of the aesthetic um, sensibility as well, that it's not just trying to reproduce something and make it look as real as possible. Um, it, it does have, uh, you know, sort of, yeah, as, as, 
I mean, an aesthetic quality. And, uh, and perhaps some of that aesthetic sensibility comes from um, my understanding of desire. Desire and attraction is, you know, is, is in the work. Yeah, I, I think it's beautiful. I wouldn't make something that I didn't think was beautiful. I wouldn't make something just to shock someone. Like that's I hate I hate work that's there to to um, to make people feel um, disgusted. I, I don't want to do that. That's the opposite of what I want to do. And so the other part of your question was um, a life after I've made them. Well, that I yeah I am really interested in that. And part of it is 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 uh, the the uh, mechanism of empathy. So a lot of these creatures, um, I hope to, uh, I make them in a way that hopefully engages the viewer's empathy. And empathy is when you feel something for someone else. So I purposefully present situations where the viewer has the possibility to empathize. If something is too disgusting or violent or aggressive or affronting, then you're not going to empathize. And if you're not going to empathize, then you're just not going to connect with it and you're not going to actually get to the idea that, that the work's about. You're just going to dismiss it and think, oh, that's just some punk work that's just you know, trying to make me look stupid. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to make people feel stupid because I like people. I like the audience and I don't condescend to them. I don't try and put myself above them and tell them that I know the answer or that I'm better than them. I'm just as um, amazed by the nature around us and confounded by the things that we're doing. And I want to discuss it with people and that's my motivation for making work. If I didn't like people and didn't think highly of them, then I wouldn't make this kind of work that really really is aimed at, at, at everybody. It's not aimed at an art conoscenti, um, a few select people that might possibly buy my work. Um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm really interested in talking to everyone. And, and, you know, that could be a problem in the art world as well, because art generally is not for everyone. It never has been. Uh. One more question, please. <laughs> uh, concerning the second question, because I was asking, uh, because I'm wondering, uh, for me, your sculptures and uh, the creatures that are you creating are uh, creations, yeah. not only not only design. That's why I'm asking, uh, have you imagined a life for them? Because some someday they will be real. Oh right! Do I imagine? That this was no. the question. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh uh, no, no. I don't expect people to make a boot flower. No, no, no. I don't expect people to make a bat baby. No, I don't. I no. They're all. But for your own sake, I mean, for no, your no, imagination. No. No? I I don't. I don't want to. No. I just. No. These are artworks. You know. These are stories. Um, I don't. I don't want to be a scientist, or I don't want to. Um, I don't want to say we should make this transgenic orangutan boy. No, I don't think we should do that. That's not my place. That's not my role. Um, but my role is to make these artworks, and people go up to them knowing that they're artworks. They're not tricked by them. They understand the and actually can. Uh, relate to the stories that they tell and those stories become part of the culture that we together um, weave and um, and they might come out in somebody else's artwork or cooking or politicizing or teaching or parenting that that's what I that's my that's my eventual outcome that's what I want yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't, I don't want anyone to make this stuff. It's an, it's an idea, it's a concept. Yeah. Thank you. Hvala, še kakšno vprašanje? I want to ask 
then it, I think, when I understand, you want to raise awareness of the people, what, uh, how they think and uh, how they uh, compete, not compete, uh, how they are uh, thinking, not in the way of consumer thinking, but uh, with their heads and in uh, out of the box in in one in in a kind of way that they think uh, what like you said what is real uh, real uh, nice or what is it doesn't mean that someone tell you this is nice and not the other thing but they have to think with their heads what is really nice and why it is nice because yeah. for someone is one thing interesting and for the other one is the other thing interesting we are not made like clones that we are all the same but we have to think how we are uh, dealing with uh, with with our society with our work and we all the, also with how we are playing with gene technology and what we will do in the future is it the point or yeah more? absolutely that's a huge part of it i'm really interested in speaking with people about you know our role in uh, in using these new technologies absolutely that's that's a really big part of it yeah, um, because I think that I think that that's you know a really important and important uh, sort of shift that's happening today, and it, we're living through it. And art can be a great place to you know, talk about these things. I think that's a huge part of the work, um, and also I think that a lot of the work is also quite. Um, you know, mythological kind of story based, yeah. uh, kind of wondrous, um, kind of jo kind of humorous and joyful. Ultimately, quite optimistic, um, even if some people think it's you know a little bit uh, intense. Um, but yeah, it definitely has a strong ethical side to it, and I and I think that yeah. Big part, yeah. Thank you. Some of your works are part are making part of this exhibition group exhibition, 50 years of uh, hyper realistic sculpture. Uh, how do you see your work in comparison with the other artists and their works? Well, um, well, I use realism in my work. Um, but I think I use it in a different way to do different things. Uh, I mean, I admire a lot of these sculptors very much. They're very good at what they do, and 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 you know, it's very admirable. And I, you know, you could see, you know, that they're very interested in the process of it, and and they do it all themselves, and it's pretty amazing. It's pretty inspiring, actually. Uh, but I, I'm I use realism for different. For different ends, I suppose. I'm, I use realism to represent things that often aren't real. Um, they're just uh, concepts. I, I just use it as a vehicle, um, uh, as a vehicle for an idea. It's not. It's not. Um, yeah, it's not the sort of my my, my aim is not to reproduce reality. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that's funny, that's why I asked you, yeah. because you mentioned before that yeah. you don't represent reality. No, not really. <laughs> and the but title of this exhibition is Realistic Sculpture, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Hvala, uh, Shekdo. Chene, uh, we can also continue unofficially after yes. this, if you have yeah, some absolutely. more time. and. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you guys. Thank you for coming. In samo še vabilo vsem izvolite na razstavo tukaj bodo 14. oktobra letos 
in uh, uživajte v edini uh, samostojni pregledni razstavi Patricije Pičinini letos na svetu, ne samo v Evropi. Tako da dobrodošli še naprej. Thank you very much.